All right. Can you all hear me? Just fine? Awesome. All right. Thank you, Miko. Uh, all right. So welcome to my talk. Welcome to Small FP Conf. This is OCaml Reborn, and I apologize in advance for any non-intended puns that may arise with this talk. This is full stack applications with ReasonML. And I'm really excited to have been here last year and coming back again, kind of closing the loop on speaking at ClojureTray and small FP Conf. Uh, my name is uh, Antonio. I work at a small company in California called Ladder. And we're building a fully automated, fully online uh, life insurance product to help families get covered and their loved ones. I've also built something called Luma, which is a uh, kind of small cross-platform fast ClojureScript environment in REPL that runs on Node.js. But most recently, I've been working on Reason ML in the OCaml ecosystem, and that's what this talk is going to be about today. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the story here starts with uh, Clojure and ClojureScript, actually. Um, Clojure is how I came to functional programming, to doing it every day and liking it. And I still write it every day at my job. Uh, but in the past couple of years, I've, I've been very involved in OCaml, uh, especially through ReasonML. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, so this talk is about my journey to finding a suitable, safe, productive workflow and developer experience for developing full stack applications in uh, OCaml and Reason. And this talk is mostly focused on the web platform, but the all, most, if not all, aspects of it could be extrapolated to work with any mobile, native, or other application that is backed by a server. Uh, also, a little disclaimer, um, there are many opinions in this talk. You may not agree with them, and that's OK. I do not expect you to. And so if you disagree, or even if you agree, please come talk to me afterwards. I love to discuss th those with you. Um, all right, so back in 2016, uh, I discovered this little project by Facebook uh, and Hacker News called uh, Reason. And it purported to be a new interface to OCaml. And I had heard of OCaml. I, I even used it in college for a couple courses. And you, some of you may relate to this. It's one of those cases where the professor almost guarantees that you'll never touch a technology ever again. Uh, and, so, and so I was like, OK, what is this thing reason that they're talking about? And uh, what, what they made it be and how they announced it was a, syntax, a friendly syntax and tool chain for the OCaml platform. And that means it's, it's still OCaml, uh, which means that it leverages ev everything in its ecosystem from compiling to portable bytecode to really fast native code, uh, compiling to JavaScript, and even compiling to unikernels, which are these uh, operating systems as libraries, which you can run directly on hypervisors. And they have like this crazy started startup time of 20 to 50 milliseconds, because they do not include the whole operating system kernel, but only the parts that you will use out of it. That's a topic for another time that I'm also really interested in. Um, so reason is kind of how I came to OCaml again. And even though I'm writing mostly in OCaml syntax nowadays, uh, I'm still a regular contributor to the reason project, because I'm, I really appreciate their goals. And so being newcomer friendly and extend o o o extending OCaml's reach is something that really worked for me. So I really appreciate what they're doing. Um, but let's kind of take a step back here and understand like, what is the problem that I'm trying to set up here. And the, 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 the question here is, why look outside of Clojure at all? Um, and my reasons for that is, and, and I still kind of really like Clojure, and I use it every day, as I said before, but uh, what I started looking for uh, some things initially that Clojure couldn't offer. And some of those are that um, I, I can't really keep a lot of things in my head while I'm programming. And I would rather have a compiler check the, the, the entire flow of my program for me. And this, again, is the, the part wh where I was talking about, about before. Uh, it, this, is, this is an opinion, right? This, this, this works well for me. It might not work for you. But I found out that this, this is a really nice way to, to, to program for, for, for me. And, and so it helps me write and refactor programs. And I didn't know at the time. But what I was looking for was a, 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 a pragmatic yet safer language that would guide me writing my programs. Um, and Clojure at the time couldn't offer exactly what I wanted. Um, so 
The starting point for me, as I said, was my experience with Clojure. And moving to OCaml, I, I needed to replicate some of the, the really nice things that Clojure had uh, and the workflow that I had and, and further uh, enhance them with the OCaml platform. And so one of those things is how easy it is to build full stack applications that share code between, uh, you know, all across the board, from the, the front end to the back end. In, in, in Clojure, uh, .clgc files help so much with that. Um, the, the, the Eden uh, and Transit integrated experience, how you can just round trip values and, and send them over the, the, the network, uh, unmarshalling and unmarshalling just feels natural because you're always working with Clojure's data structures and, and, and Transit or Eden just take care of uh, kind of marshalling and unmarshalling them over the network for you. And, and the third point here, I guess, is the, the, the Datomic experience. And Datomic is truly the database within your own code. It does not feel external at all. And it's so integrated. It's such a nice experience that I also wanted that. And MongoDB can kind of feel like that a little bit in JavaScript world, but it has some other trade-offs that, that didn't really work for me. Um, especially, it's, it doesn't have a schema, and, uh, or by default, it doesn't have a schema. And all the options that you have to put a schema on top of MongoDB are language specific, and they, do, 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 they don't uh, work well from one language to the other. So my, my, my quest started um, when I started doing OCaml more seriously was, was really how does this uh, integrated development experience look like? And, and, and I, want, I really wanted to find out about that. Uh, so for those of you who haven't come across OCaml before, it is a pragmatic, strongly typed systems programming language with over 30 years of research and development. Uh, it's what I would call a, an 80% an, an uh, language, both in terms of coverage and correctness. And this is uh, comparing it to, uh, so, so the 100% the example here would be Ascal or Idris, where, uh, which I'm asserting are a little bit less pragmatic, simply because they're more restrictive. Uh, they, they, they force you to kind of uh, type all your side effects so that the language can understand them. And in OCaml, for example, you can intertwine side effects uh, 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 between your, your, uh, your, your program code. So it's not, it's not a pure language, but the type system is still 100% sound. Uh, it's also multi-purpose. Uh, you can write imperative code. You can write functional code. You can also write object-oriented code in OCaml. And it's multi-target, as I mentioned before. It's also really fast. It's kind of a funny. Uh, thing because I had been working in one way or another with VMs for the past couple of years that coming coming back to a language that doesn't have a kind of a, a VM uh, that doesn't run on top of a VM was I guess it was a nice rediscovery that it runs so fast um, so but for a little while it wasn't immediately clear to me how to kind of overcome the challenges that I was facing, especially, especially with typing at the boundary. And that, that I think that's the main issue, the thing that I really didn't understand and still have some trouble with today. Because types are really awesome in your program. As long as you don't communicate with the external world, it's, it's also r fun and nice when you're on your little island, you know the types of everything. But as soon as you receive data from the network, that you don't know the shape of it. It, it kind of becomes weird and complex in all sorts of ways. And so the other thing was type definitions that span across the stack and, and how I could share these types that are common for uh, in, all across my program. But now I, I needed this ty these types in, in the front end. I also needed them in the back end. So how do I share them? How do I serialize across the network was another challenge that I was facing. Uh, it, Make and, and uh, when you're faced with these troubles, it may kind of lead you to think that types are absolutely useless. And um, well, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is they're not, or not so much. But before that, um, let's take a detour to kind of come back to this after with another understanding of uh, GraphQL. Because it uh, turns out, uh, at, at the same time I was exploring OCaml, or even before that, I was also and still am a little bit interested in the topic of these data-driven architectures uh, in today's applications. And I was a contributor to Omnext uh, a couple years ago, which distilled some of these very nice ideas embodied by GraphQL. And GraphQL, if you've never come across it, is 
this um, basically a spec for a query language for your API in the same vein that um, URLs could be the, 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 the API for, for REST. Uh, GraphQL is this query language that you can use to solve the uh, underfetching or overfetching problem. So sometimes you're, you're working with an API and you, it, the, the, these API calls return you less or more data than you actually need. And you may have to do a bunch of network requests to, get, to finally get everything that you need. And what GraphQL allows you to do is to um, compose a query with the shape of data, uh, the, the exact data that you need, send it with one network request, and um, have it come back with a response of all the data that you need for the task that you're uh, trying to accomplish in your programs. And, and so GraphQL has this notion of what they call a type system. Uh, and the motivation for that uh, is that it is useful to have uh, an exact description of the data that we can ask for from a service. So the type system is something that completely describes the set of possible data that you can query on a GraphQL service. So what this is is really, uh, it is a typed schema. And turns out this maps really well to the OCaml type system. Um, and there, there are a bunch of uh, uh, GraphQL implementations uh, in possibly every language, every language that you can think of. And for OCaml, there, there is uh, OCaml GraphQL server, which has two really nice features. And so the first one is that it reconciles the GraphQL type system with the OCaml type system, allowing you to, to write a, 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 a GraphQL schema in OCaml that upon a successful compilation, basically guarantees that your, uh, your, your, your schema is compliant with the GraphQL spec. And that, that is a really nice property to have uh, at compile time. And, and so we're going to see a, a demo of a very simplistic to-do application, and then gr go through, kind of the, uh, compare the, the, the challenges that I faced with the solutions that I eventually found. And so this is just a, 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 a very simple demo of like a to-do application that where, where you can add to-dos, uh, mark them as completed, or even delete them. And you know, we've, we've all seen this before in one way or the other. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the directory layout for, for this application could look like the following, right? There's a, there's a client folder with client-specific code with an app file that queries the GraphQL schema on the server a server folder which has the GraphQL schema and the server-specific code inside, and then a shared folder that is used by both the client build and the server build. And then the way you define data in this uh, full stack application would be you'd put your types and your common code that work on those types in this shared folder. And, and say we have our type to-do that has a title and a, a completed property. The server uses this to-do type to build the GraphQL schema the client would use this type to build to 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 model the UI, but but there's still the challenge and the pending question of how does it work at the boundary? It's really nice when we have the to do type on the server and when you have it on the client, but network communication is untyped. So how do, how did we solve that? So OCaml, Gra OCaml GraphQL server because it has uh, information about every possible field and its type on the schema it can provide you automatic serialization of, uh, of these values to JSON. And so that part is, uh, uh, was solved then. On the client, you could add this buckle script record. Buckle script is the OCaml compiler to JavaScript. And so you can add this directive to a query that you're composing um, called, please, when I, when I query for, for, the, for these to-dos with these fields, please, uh, when data com comes back, please parse that into this type that I already have on, uh, in the current scope, and in our case would be the to-do type. But, but then there, there's another question, which, which is what happens if suddenly I query for a field that does not exist on the, the, the schema server side? And, 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 and turns out this is a really nice property to have on the client as well, which is because the client before comp compilation is aware of the schema on the server, if, you, if you're querying for something that does not exist on the schema, it throws you a compile time error with the location information for the field that you're querying, saying, yeah, I don't know about this. Either add it on the schema or please remove it. And, and so this was a really nice realization when it happened to me. So kind of putting things side by side, 
the way I achieved a, a CLJC kind of code in OCaml was to have different builds, one for JS, one for native, and then have these shared modules that have the common code and the common types. In, in, uh, in, in Clojure, you have these things called reader conditionals, which allows you to uh, kind of, it, it's almost like a, a NIF statement uh, for the, the platform that you're compiling to. And OCaml has something similar, just not as quite flexible, which is more similar to C preprocessor macros, if you've ever come across that. Um, and for Clojure's immutability, um, OCaml also has uh, immutable values. And they're kind of an afterthought, though. And, and their uh, persistent data structure, for example, could be added as a library. Uh, it's just not as, I guess, not as flexible and not as integrated because the data literals are not as closures. Uh, for Eden transit route tripping, we, we achieved that with GraphQL auto serialization of values. And there's also this thing called custom sca scalers that are in the GraphQL spec. And what they, do, they allow you to do is to define a custom scaler, such as a date or date time uh, type, which you provide your own serialization for. And then you can communicate across the network, and you can marshal them and unmarshal them uh, according to the, the own uh, serializers that you provided. This is kind of like transit uh, extensions, if you've seen that before. Um, as for the datomic experience, it turns out GraphQL, if you're using, say, MongoDB again, is much better than any language uh, specific uh, schema that you can build on, on top of it, but it's still not quite the datomic experience, and, and you know, meh, I still haven't found anything like, quite like datomic. In, in, in the, I guess, in the OCaml world. Uh, one thing, though, GraphQL is not really required. I chose to use it because I really like it. Um, if, you do, if, you don't, if you don't know or you don't like GraphQL for one reason or the other, there's this thing that you can use called ATD, and it stands for Adaptable Type Definitions. And this is something that you can, you can write your types in this .ATD ATD file and have the, the program generate serializers and deserializers for them automatically, so you could also use that instead of GraphQL. Um, again, I mentioned this in the, in the beginning, but what works for me may not work for, well, well for you. I tend to think as programs as living organisms where they're always evolving and mutating, and you're adding new features and refactoring old code. For me, uh, the way I like to solve problems, having a type system and a compiler b behind me, you know, saying all the things I did wrong and where those errors are has worked really well and still works really well. If you disagree, please, I encourage you, come talk to me. I want to hear your opinion. And yeah, that's all I had. You can find the demo that I uh, showed you, the, the GIF. Basically, it's deployed to that first link. There's a, play, a playground, uh, for a GraphQL playground that you can play with at slash GraphQL. And uh, the, the, the demo code is uh, on my GitHub at Reason GraphQL full stack. I, I'll tweet out the, the, the slides later so you, you, can, you can find the links there. All right, thank you.